Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, to welcome you all to Abu Dhabi Art and to this talk this afternoon with uh, Idris Khan. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome Idris to uh, Abu Dhabi Art. Um, before we get to the thing that you all want to hear about, which is obviously Idris talking about his project, I'd just like to say a few words about Idris and, and the project itself. Um, Idris's work, which is as well as what we're going to be, to be talking about, is also represented here at Abu Dhabi Art by Sean Kelly Gallery, spans the fields of photography, video and sculpture, and draws on a diverse range of sources, from literature and music to the history of art and the history of photography to religion. And his work is in many public collections around the world, including the Saatchi Collection in London, the San Francisco Museum of Art, the Guggenheim in New York, the de Young Museum in San Francisco, and the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Idris was born in Birmingham and in the UK in 1978, the son of a surgeon who moved from the UK to the UK from Pakistan, and a Welsh mother who trained as a pianist but worked as a nurse. And thanks to his father's heritage, Idris was brought up in the Muslim tradition, as part of which he took regular, regular Quran lessons until the age of 14. He attended the University of Derby, where he studied photography, and then went to the Royal College of Art in London, where he studied fine art. And it was as part of his degree show at the Royal College that Idris produced a very personal walk, work that nevertheless brought him to wider public attention, every page of the Holy Quran. as a densely layered work that made up of scans of all 1,953 pages of his father's Quran. And on reflecting on the piece, I'm just going to quote you now, you said soon afterwards, I'd always felt that the process of reading the Quran led directly to my repetitive mode of making art. You read the Quran a page a week, meaning you're constantly returning to the same page. Idris's first solo show followed soon after in 2006 at Victoria Miro Gallery in London, at which he exhibited more works that displayed the same fiendishly complex layering technique that he'd used in some of the works for his degree show at the RCA. The work stemmed from a seemingly straightforward proposition. What would happen if you could see each page of a book all at the same time, or if you could hear every note from a sonata all at the same time, or if you could work, view the works of an artist's whole life's work all at the same time. It's a question and an approach that Idris has used to explore the works of Roland Barthes and Susan Sontag, as well as the architectural photography of Bernd and Hiller Becker, as well as Beethoven's scores for piano, which Idris reproduced in a single work entitled Struggling to Hear after Ludwig van Beethoven sonatas in 2005. As the writer Jeff Dyer once said, Idris's work is dense, multi-layered, quite literally, and profound. In 2012, Karl was commissioned by the British Museum in London to create a new wall drawing for its touring exhibition, Hajj, Journey to the Heart of Islam. The exhibition featured a specially commissioned site-specific mural, You and Only You, which was made of a series of texts hand-stamped directly onto a wall that recorded fragments of responses of pilgrims' experiences of performing Hajj. The show also included one of Idris' sculptural works seven times, an installation of 144 sandblasted steel cubes with layered Arabic inscriptions, which was installed in the British Museum's Great Court. In the same year, the New York Times magazine also commissioned Idris to create a new body of work, a series of composite images that depicted London's iconic tourist sites. Idris said at the time that the series, which included the Houses of Parliament, Buckingham Palace and St Paul's Cathedral, and I quote, what I quite like about the whole process is that these landmarks are photographed a million times a day, but you can create more than just a document, a feeling of stretched time. I tried to capture the essence of the building, something that's been permanently imprinted in someone's mind, like a memory. And it's about memory that we're here to talk about today. At the beginning of this year, Idris was chosen to be the designer of the UAE's first national memorial. It's Idris's largest work to date, and it's a memorial <clears throat> that features a central sculptural element, an associated pavilion of honor, which bears the names of 196 men and women who've given their lives in the service of the UAE since 1971, and it sits within a 42,000 square meter new public park called the Oasis of Dignity. Now, we're very lucky here today because this is a project that has not actually been open to the public yet, so it's kind of, in essence, this is a sneak peek of part of the project. But we're going to focus on the concept behind your project, the process of fabrication and manufacture, and, and, and we're going to talk about it in those terms. So it's hopefully not too much of a reveal. Um, 
So with that, welcome. Good afternoon, Indris, and I'll leave you to so start much. talking. Um, yeah, and it's, it has been such a, an, an amazing uh, journey over the last uh, seven months. I found that I uh, won the competition in March this year. Um, we had a first briefing in January uh, where we were standing in the middle of this 42,000 square meter park on a concrete slab with a flagpole and we were told, I was told, go with your wildest dreams to create something on this, on this landscape. And of course, you should never say that to an artist because they always just want to do the biggest thing that they could possibly build, um, in my case. Uh, there are certain site restrictions of, of height, and uh, I'm glad we actually chose the height uh, in the end because it's 23 meters high by around about 120 meters long. And not only did I receive that commission, but I also got asked to make a pavilion space or to help lead the design of, of a pavilion space, and of course, using architects and engineers and coming up and, and crossing over. I mean, the whole thing really for me was an amazing experience of talking and collaborating and understanding people's roles throughout the entire process. Yes, I'm the artist with the vision, but the energy that was given to the project was from a lot of voices and a lot of people um, getting very excited about what was going to happen. And, and I remember talking to the landscape architect early on. He said, you know, we always knew there was going to be a memorial here, but we had no idea it was going to be as big as this. And everything had to change. As soon as March happened, it was like, what? Now we have to accommodate this huge structure. And it's, you know, it's amazing how quickly and um, well everything has been brought together uh, in six months. So I'll start with my first slide. I'm going to go through some early sketches and technical drawings just to try and get you to understand where my mind was at the time of creating. Um, and this is an image by an artist called Chris Burden. I really like Chris's work. He, he, they're quite performative. He does a lot of performances, and especially sculpt, sculpt, sculptural performances. Um, this, is, this is a piece called Drop, I think, and um, where he had a concrete set right before it was just about to go off, and he had a, 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 a huge uh, crane at 100 foot high. And as it was setting, the concrete was setting, so it was just done in one evening. He just dropped these beams from the hundred foot and just and just stood and, and you know and then just stood up straight as it was setting and then again and again and again and again and I think that image that image really inspired this sort of idea of unity between objects and you know using big forms steel forms aluminium metal and how things could almost almost touch. Touching, almost touching, almost resting, leaning against each other. And then that's what then took me into the ideas surrounding the, the sculpture. Um, I always knew that I wanted to have calligraphy, or if you think about memorials in general, you want to see writing, you want to be able to touch it, you want to obviously, you know, first ideas was, well, maybe we should put the soldiers' names on the actual sculpture itself. And then it came down to actually, you know, reading poetry from, from the leaders over the past 30 years and finding the, the, the right piece of writing for the, for the surface of the, the sculpture. I also knew I wanted it to, to play with the shadow and light of the monument, you know, just walking through it, engaging with the material and also the changing of light throughout the whole piece. And then I found this kind of strange image where <laughs> you had these gravestones just falling. And I said, well, that's not what this is supposed to be about. We don't want to see anything falling. We wanted to see it being supported. So that then that idea was, don't let it fall. I mean, that's why this, this lecture is called Begin at the End, because if you think about it, when I go down to what I'm actually making, there is no beginning and there is no end to this sculpture. Because, yes, you see it start proud at the, at the front, and then everything behind it sort of just falls into the ground. But then you can also read it the other way, pushing up from the ground mm. forwards. So these were a little, just a few sketches and things that was trying to inspire my way of thinking for the piece. And this was the first thing I drew on a napkin <laughs> in, uh, in London. And as you can see, it was starting to 
formulate the idea of what this structure would look like, a very simple line sketch to then creating things on the actual landscape. And I, I remember and Mark, who's the engineer who works with me in the studio, we were just, I was always doing this with my hands. <laughs> and we had to try and translate that into an actual sculpture. Um, and then, you know, and then various little sketches. And then I looked at the park and I thought, OK, can I just like go over the entire thing, have all these like beams leaning up against each other? And, and then, anyway, the design process happened. And then we eventually had this drawing. Just in, just, in those, just in those early sketches before we get to this stage, there's always, and this is something that you see if, you're, if, you, if you get the chance <coughs> to go and see the memorial once it's open, please do so. Um, there's a softness, there's a, there's a gradation to the way you've treated those early sketches. And that's something that really kind of comes through, obviously, when you see it in person. Was that, that, that sense of kind of, that sense of gradation and that sense of kind of uh, a form that changes, was that there from the very early period? It was. I mean, it, you know, I wanted it to, 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 I wanted to have a sensitive sensitivity, if you like. I wanted to have a poetry, um, especially within the form. There's a lovely rhythm to it, and it's not just this huge, you know, in a sense, you know, the scale is big, but it's not just, it's monumental, but it's not the, it's, I, I wanted to have that softness, softness of, of looking with your eye to, to, to move to, it to, to one side and, and things constantly changing. So it, it always creates a rhythm as you look at it, I think. And then, you know, we were very early to, to actually position the piece in, in, the, in, the, in the, the west side, south side, west side, west side of the park. And, and then we sort of developed it into these technical drawings, which is very much about creating a journey through the park. The plaza was always there in the, in the, in the central, which is a beautiful reflecting pool now. And then the whole thing, you know, I wanted it to be a journey, this idea of walking through, coming to the first two tablets, having a sense of grandeur, and then actually making a sculpture that was, that you could enter, you could get into its heart and feel, and feel its heart, if you imagine that somehow. Um, and I think you do, you get this sense of a real feeling of loss and then hope and pride. Um, and that was, again, you know, bringing back to the surface of actually wanting to try and make a surface that you wanted to touch. It's very much, it's very much, I mean, you talk about working with the, uh, engineers and the landscape architects, it's very much an environment. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a sculptural piece, but it's also something, as you say, that you enter, that you move through. It's not something that you can com comprehend in one go. No, and, and exactly, and, and even from a, from a distance, um, I don't think you get a, a sense of scale. Obviously, you know something there is big, but when you're actually next to it, and it invites you to go inside it, because I think, you know, one of the most the key words at the start of the project was trying to create something that was immersive. I wanted to create an immersive space so you were really, you were transported or transformed with these big structural forms next to you, um, feeling its weight, but also feeling its, uh, you know, it being delicate and being almost sort of light and uh, trying to create a certain emotion. And then this is another early render of of playing with where water features would go. And that, another thing was really important to, to, to try and have a, a, incorporate a water feature into the sculpture as well, which, which almost acted like a, a wayfinder through the piece. There's a, if you could just talk a little bit about kind of the, the whole ensemble is a kind of, there's, a, there's, a, there's the plaza, there's the, the kind of the monument itself um, that uses water to lead you on this journey where you're taken to the circular structure that we can see in this image, which is the Pavilion of Honor. Um, there's a, was it your idea to kind of use the water to kind of take you through that narrative? Apple? Absolutely, and I think it's, uh, it's playful as well. I, it's, a lot of these things, are, especially when you're doing something like this, is you have to have this uh, combination of different um, of things to make the viewer feel either make the viewer feel comfortable within the space, within the environment, to engage with the environment around it. I, thought that, I think that was very important for me. So when you're inside the sculpture and you see this trickling, it's, and it's a, water, it's a stream, a rill, that guides you down, you want them to keep following that. There has to be, you know, it's, it's, it's the journey through the sculpture, down, down through the spine, 
into the, into, the, into the floor that then takes you all the way to the pavilion. And I think that that's, it's, a playful, it's a playful environment, you know? It's, it's, it's a relaxing sound. And uh, yeah, I want the viewer to experience the entire thing. And, and that's why, so this is the sort of final render um, before going into, to, to make the work. And as you can see, some of the calligraphy um, on the tablets. And again, that was another way for me to make the viewer look for things throughout the work. I wanted it to be a sort of discovery. And the language itself, I used two techniques. I stamped the language into the mold of the aluminium uh, before it got free poured and cast. Um, and I also sandblasted the text. I didn't want it to become something where the calligraphy was the most dominant part of the piece. I wanted it so the calligraphy would disappear and become part of the sculpture. So the viewer would be guided in some way to look for this little, you know, the, 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 the moments of, of calligraphy, but not necessarily be directed just by the calligraphy. <clears throat> so in a way, the sculpture form became the most important thing. The calligraphy was just embedded and it was there and viewers could engage with it if they wanted to. But actually, it's just a way to move your eye around a space. I was going to say, because there are various moments when you're walking around, and actually some of the parts of the calligraphy actually appear very high up on some of the, uh, on some of the tablets. Yes. So, so that's kind of where you position those pieces of calligraphy, is purposefully to move the person around and through. Yeah, and to direct their eye. When you have something so, you know, so large, yes, you look up, but if you have something that you're trying to look at or look for, then in another playful element, you try, you can, it guides you to the top, then it brings you down to the bottom, then you see something in the distance and you want to go and read it and touch it. So there was, there was this, you know, again, just to, to play with the viewer's mind within the space and to, to want to go through it, to want to leave it, to want to sort of, you know, you, you, can, read the, you can read the writing, but I wanted it so it was almost like these moments of traces. And I think that's very much what links me back to the, earlier work, when you layer up something so much, you're actually deleting the language that's underneath, but what you're left with is a series of traces. So I wanted the language, the calligraphy, to just feel part of the work, to be engaged with, but also to s just slightly come in and out of clarity. One of the other things... It, gave, it almost gave the piece a historical context immediately. You know, it was... I wanted to create something that looked like it'd always been there. One of the other things you said to me previously was the kind of, you know, in the way that in your other work where you've layered layers of layer upon layer upon layer, it's part of that is actually about making the viewer stand and pay attention and to, and to kind of slow things down and to look. And that very much kind of plays through in the terms of how you feel. And you'll have to take our word for this because you won't have seen the memorial. Uh, when you're walking through the space, it does make you stop. It's not something that you can just look at and comprehend straight away. They need each other. You know, the, the sculpture needs the, the, it needs the writing. And, you know, the writing obviously needs a surface to be embedded into. But <clears throat> I don't think it would be as strong as it, as it is without the writing there. As you say, there's a, there's a moment that you have to engage the viewer to look further for something. And I think you know, with the early stamp works and, and, and the photographs, you know, I think I want, you're, you're creating an environment for people to sort of almost fall into. The gutter of those book, early book, you know, the Quran, mm. is so strong, that black gutter, that you want, the viewer becomes engaged, but also just has to look for things, is searching for something. And I think that's what, you know, life is, is, is can be about, you know, a certain, you're constantly searching for something. I feel like it's highlighted here in the piece, you know, looking for something, being immersed around, having an incredible emotion of, of loss, of feeling of, uh, uh, and, and, then that, and then that trace of something is very ghostly. It's not in your face. It's not there. It's to be there to just to, just to create a softer touch to the materiality of the object. Mm. Should we go to the next? Uh... Yeah, yeah, sorry. So then the pavilion. So now we're just moving on to the sort of pavilion. And, and then this is the sketch for the pavilion roof. Early on, I was just like, well, you know, we're upright and we're sort of collapsing, everything's supporting. But then how about we, we create a very protective environment where the tablets themselves form the roof 
of the pavilion. And then another early sketch of just trying to create an environment with paintings. Um, I wanted to use glass. I knew I wanted to use glass early on. Um, and I, used, I wanted to have an oculus in the roof. And then, so this was very early in terms of the viewer standing in the middle of seven paintings around you and creating seven you know, Emirati states that were together and the togetherness in the center of the pavilion. Again, a few little sketches, and then this was the, the final render for the work. So as you can see, the, the roof structure is the sort of tablets forming, um, forming these incredible geometric shapes. Um, the walls of the pavilion are cladded with 11 tons of recycled aluminium um, that has been recycled from armored vehicles coming back from conflict. And I think then, you know, when you're in there, you get this incredible sense of um, protection somehow. It feels very strong. The nameplates of the soldiers are surround the room, um, and they are, put, they are embedded into the wall, so that if one of the nameplates is pushed in, and a light comes on to highlight the, uh, the soldier's name. But even uh, the, the, your use of water to guide people around the site, and also kind of... Uh, to actually kind of dictate almost the kind of rhythm of the procession through the site even comes down into this structure as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It does. So it dis the water disappears as you, as you enter the pavilion, but then is revealed again, and it's moving in an anti-clockwise direction. And so then again, the, 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 the viewer is invited to walk around in an anti-clockwise um, way to follow the water. So therefore, then you can follow the names, and you're searching for the names there. And, and then the glass structure in the center of the, work, uh, the piece is made up of seven pieces of glass, and it has the soldier's oath repeated, um, I think it's around about 10 or 12 times, just repeated around the glass stru structure. So you have the soldiers looking in to the oath of the country. And I thought that was a very nice engagement. And then there's really lovely, when you're inside, and this is just highlights the lights that come on, on, on in, front of the, in front of the names. And, you know, I, it's so beautiful right now because they really do feel like they're candle lights all around the room. And it's a, it's a very sort of emotional um, experience. Sorry. So, so the idea is what we're looking at here now is that each of those squares, each of those tiles that's lit, that's the tile that has the person's details on. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and tell me also about... Um, You've got the balance here of kind of natural light and, and, and artificial light. Just tell me a little bit more about how, the, how you want the light to work in this structure. Because obviously here you're dealing with even the, the daylight is a very, can be a very strong source of light. Yeah, and I, and I was very conscious of the fact that this, the park would probably be visited late at night or after five, you know, when it's a little bit cooler and, and, and you can really spend time in the park. And that combination of, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a huge James Terrell fan of, of, of linking the two sources of light that creates another ethereal um, uh, feeling. And the light almost is another way of engaging the viewer into looking at something further around the nameplates. And of course, then you have these dramatic sunlight hitting it and bouncing off the surface. And I think it's just a lovely environment to want to spend time in. I think that was probably one of the key things for me. How can I? How can I, again, slow the viewer down to actually want to be in there to contemplate, to feel the emotion of what's happening uh, within the room? And the water also helps with that because it just keeps moving and moving and, and, and surrounding the glass sculpture in the, in, the, in the center. And you really want to sort of spend time in this room, I think. And then by, by leaving it open to the elements as well, it's not a closed environment, you're engaging again with the landscape around the space. In terms of how, I mean, obviously, the there's a significant park that's, a, that's around the, the elements that you've designed. And, and in terms of kind of getting that relationship between your parts of the, I mean, I'm not saying that you weren't involved in the whole thing, but there's kind of, there's a, there's a partnership here, isn't there, between you and the, the designers. And so what's your kind of sense of the relationship between the sculptural elements and, and the broader landscape? I, I, I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I don't know whether, um, uh, I don't know whether the, the, particularly the, the team expected me to have so much or want to have so much interest in what was going on around the piece. Um, 
uh, when they first uh, asked me to do it. <laughs> but I think that eventually they found that, you know, the concept and ideas that they have to be in partnership. They have to complement each other. And so therefore, in a way, it became a sort of artist-led vision throughout the entire park, I think, which, makes, which is why I think it's so successful. There were, there were always conversations about what, next, what, what goes next to the tablets, what kind of floor, you know, bringing in that sort of, the, you know, bringing in materials that will complement the sculpture. You know, the, what color is the water going to be? You know, what trees are going to be next? To, just to incorporate the entire thing. And I think that's such a, such a credit to, 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 to make this thing all unite. And, um, and I think that's where its success will be eventually. We're looking now at um, oh, sorry. Some, some, some pictures of... Um, this is, you tell us, this is the foundry. Yes, yeah, so this is the foundry in Brisbane. It's a company called uh, Urban Art Projects, UAP. Um, and they, you know, <laughs> went out of their way to create something this quickly. It's an unbelievable. I remember walking into the, to the foundry for the first time after they'd started fabricating all the 900... I mean, a little bit about the actual piece itself. It's 300 tons of steel. It's 115 tons of aluminium. Um, and there are 900 hand-painted panels to create the gradation on the whole thing. So each and every panel has been hand-painted and sanded to the correct gradation. And these are just pouring. So this is me in the foundry in Brisbane doing the first initial test that then the painters would have to follow. So I was, again, using the same process that I've always done, applying paint, rubbing it away, applying paint, rubbing it away, having this, you know, this cycle of events to create the actual painting, sanding, rubbing away, sanding, rubbing away. So this engagement of, of, of something being there and being lost, being there and being lost, is there throughout the whole thing. It's gradiated from 50% at the top to 10% at the bottom, and you can see the sort of color gradations there. And, you know, I, I suppose I, I really wanted a surface that would be a very painterly surface. You know, almost like you're looking at 32 paintings. And first of all, and they're all unique. <laughs> first, first of all, what was it that the, what was it that the foundry in because Australia is a long way to go for the foundry. What, what was it that the foundry there could do that you know that couldn't be done anywhere else? What were they able to bring to the? I think they were engaged early on that they 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 um, they're brought onto projects to find artists for um, big public artworks, um, and they do things incredibly well at massive scale. And you know, I was talking to Annie, my wife. Um, it's also an artist about whether an artist's work, you know, from this is the biggest thing I've ever done, can translate at a large scale. Mm. And I think that's what I think that's what the UAP do really well is to take an artist that maybe necessarily doesn't have a, a public art background, and then to, you know, bring him into a project and actually believe in him to create it, you know, in this in this way. And and you know. They're good at it. <laughs> but this is a nice example we can see here on the image on the left of the, of the text. Just tell us a little bit about the, 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 those, achieving those two techniques. So the, the, the texture I wanted was a, a, it's a free poured aluminium. So you pour, you melt the aluminium down and you pour it into a cast and then it creates an amazing surface. I actually wanted to reverse the surface so we had to take a plasticine mold of the free pour. And then once you've done the plasticine mold, I wanted then the words to be stamped or pressed into the surface of the mold, as you can see here with this image, taking CNC routed woodcuts and then hammering them into the surface. So you create this indented, uh, I, always, I always get it wrong, embossed, embossed, debossed, embossed, 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 <laughs> embossed surface. And as you can see, there were, I think, I can't remember the actually how many panels were actually stamped or sandblasted in the end, but the amount of time it's taken to actually hammer in to create these, 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 this surface is, it was, it was just, it was just unbelievable. And I was truly emotional when I first saw the, the, the entire foundry casting 900 panels. It was just unbelievable. But, you know, and also what it's done again, it's, it's created a very hand touched thing. It wasn't cut into the surface, it was pressed. So that delicacy, I think, is very nice. Pressing the words into the surface, and also in terms, of, but just in terms also of the, we spoke before about actually even the choice of the, 
script itself? What was what was the effect that you were that you were going for? The actual font. Yes. Or, yeah. Um, I, I wanted it to be modern. I wanted it to be sort of an everyday. Uh, I think it was Nazanin, the actual font we used in the end, and everyday. It, it didn't dictate what the piece felt like. You know, I mean, we did have some discussions of of whether the calligraphy should be hand painted onto the surface, but I was very adamant that. It had to be something that was now, it was now, it was being made now, not giving it a historical context because of calligraphy. Mm -hmm. It had to be, you know, now engaging with the font every day, used every day. Um, but it, I think, it, and it works, because then it, it molds into a very modernist sculpture. You know, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a minimal piece of art as well. So what that does is add, adds its own poetry, I think. Um, so then, again, I mean, just more technical things. Once the work was sandblasted as well, the, the painting uh, went on top of the, the vinyl cut to leave uh, you know, the trace of writing on the surface. And each and every um, corner panel was hand welded and hand um, stippled. So you have these incredible, um, incredible welds down the edges of the, of the piece. And the edges of the piece are very important as well. So, so this is great because this explains that so you've, you've got a central steel core. Yes. And then that is actually clad and wrapped in the... It's clad and wrapped around. And I wanted it to be a very formal uh, way of, of putting the cladding on. So I'm a massive fan of Agnes Martin's um, grid, grid paintings. So I, you know, again, looking at it like a grid, looking like a, a grid forming together or bringing it together um, piece by piece. And it is, it's, you know, there's, this is the, the prototype that was made um, in Brisbane before it was shipped over. And, and that prototype, that's having to test... Tell, uh, the us, tell me about the alignments. Yeah. And, cause well, that's because, you know, if you think about this thing, they're all cantilevered into the ground, so they're just, just touching each other. That was very important for me, to get that element of, like, just touching, you know, just meeting each other. And, you know, it was important in the narrative of what we were trying to create. Um, this is a, the, of the foundry in, in Shanghai with, with, all the, with all the plates that weren't, that didn't have the calligraphy on were made there. And then... Again, all being hand painted and hand sanded back, and that and that's, that was quite a unique thing as well because you know it was happening in two different parts of the world, mm. and those had never met each other. So all the all the all the all the <laughs> which is an incredible job again was all the painting that happened in Brisbane to all the painting that was happening in Shanghai had never been brought together. So even though you had all these gradation tests and samples, we never knew whether it was going to align perfectly, bringing it to sight. So so. Is it the case where, you, so with those panels, that you've got the situation where a piece of cladding that was actually made in, fabricated in Australia and a piece of cladding that's from China are actually meeting for the first time. <laughs> so we didn't know whether the colour was going to be perfect or not, but you know, obviously had lots of tests and lots of project managers to, to assess the quality there, to bring them together. But and no, and then it got pieced together and somehow it just does have a very, it has a, you know, there's a, there's a harmony between everything there. And that gradation changes as you move up each tablet, is that correct? correct? Yeah. Just yeah. tell us a little bit more about that. So what's, what's, what's the direction and what's Gradation happening? of 50% black at the top um, down to 10% black at the bottom. So, so you've got that kind of sense of something actually receding as, you're, as it's moving away from you? Yes, exactly. And that, gives it, that also, I mean, that kind of goes back quite nicely to the early sketches because you've got that kind of, that's that softness. You've spoken to me almost as a, you've spoken to me before about trying to create something that A, looked like it's always been there, but also that almost looked like a graphite drawing itself. It feels like a charcoal drawing, I think, exactly. Um, yeah, you have that very charcoal grey, and, and, and so the patina of it is, um, it feels soft, you want to touch it, and you almost feel like it's going to just... But also, you know, I wanted to create a piece with, like, with, that had a lot of energy. So you see these marks, it's not just purely perfectly sanded back uh, um, objects. You have this incredible energy, like the hand has actually been there doing that and creating it, you know? So that, that was important to engage with the hand being something like that. So this is the skeleton of the, of the piece, um, all the steels there before it gets, uh, before it gets cladded. And uh, again, which is quite a lovely image, I think, um, of just seeing the, the skeleton like that um, before it gets cladded. Yeah. So w what you can't see from this image, but what I think what we'll see later is, that, is, is the actual, is the, is the context. So, that, so the memorial is kind of sits between two, sits on one side of the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque, which, um, as any of you may be aware, is from Abu Dhabi, you've got this kind of very kind of glacial white uh, structure. 
and then you've got the HQ for the armed forces on the other side. Um, so it sits in the middle. And it sits in the middle. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's also a real dialogue between the memorial and the mosque. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Again, and also with the traditional uh, architecture of the mosque, giving it then a, a modern sculpture to be in, in, in front of it. And I think it is, it's, it, it, they complement each other really well. It's almost, you know, you have this glistening white, beautiful marble building, then with a very, a very solid feeling, gray tone. And, you know, there's nothing else really around with that on the backdrop of the sculpture either. And so it, it, it shoots up into the sky. It literally cuts the sky. And I think actually from the back, I don't know whether I've got a, a photograph. This is just some of the work of the pavilion being built. Um, as you can see then with the, again, the, the pavilion roof was also cladded. Um, and then the glass sculpture. I wonder if I have one final picture. So there's me sitting. So you get a sense of the scale, the true scale of it, which is kind of yeah, pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, what, what do you feel about when you look at it between the two, the mosque and the, and the, and the <coughs> so HQ? The, so the, the, so there's a, there's a, the, you, have the, you, have the, you have the mosque and then you have the memorial. There's a road between the two, but actually that's also kind of part of that conversation because uh, there were trees at various points and a, and, a, and a pedestrian bridge that have kind of been moved so that the, so that the shapes that you've created enable you to frame views of the mosque, here we go. So this is a kind of a, um, if you have to imagine that once, while you're actually walking inside the memorial, on that journey, uh, you, you do frame the views of the mosque. Yeah. There, there is a dialogue between was, the two. That was an important part for, 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 the, the, for the making of the work. I think it's, a, it's, it's a gonna be a very photographed thing in its, in its, in its lifetime. And it, you, know, you get these amazing angles of light and angles of the sky, angles of the mosque looking back. It, it gives you a different, playful dialogue with the mosque in some way. And then I think, you know, here with the reflection pool as well, you get some sort of dramatic reflections that come um, with, with both the work. And, and then again, again, that level of engagement between the two things is, is I think, is going to be a, a very nice, very nice thing. This is just the glass coming in. Um, so it's, the glass itself was 1.2 tons each, and it had to go through the roof of the pavilion and be put into a, into a shoe, and there's just the first one there um, in, in position. Um, and that's a lovely view back, I think, as well, when you're looking back through the Soldier's Oath up into the, uh, up into the monument. I wish I had a picture of it. At, that, uh, sorry, this is what we're talking about, that kind of image that you're going to create, the sharp lines of the sculpture with the, 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 the vertical lines of the, the mosque. In terms of kind of, you, you, you've spoken to me when we've spoken previously about kind of, um, about what monuments are and and kind of how you feel that they need to to work and we were kind of we were saying that kind of there's something that kind of need to allow people to project on them can you talk to me a little bit more about that and how that was kind of informing your feeling your thinking about the the design about them being kind of uh, uh, well, somewhere where you go to experience a certain type of experience that you don't get from other things well it is and i think that you know i mean early on i you, you you're given, you're given a brief, and it, and it is about the soldiers and the heroes that have lost their lives. But for me, I wanted to convey, for anyone who's ever lost anyone, any, any part of your family, how can I convey that emotion for someone coming to look at it? You know, not everyone has lost their son or a soldier. You've, we've all experienced loss in some way. And can that, trans, can that be translated in a monument or a memorial to everyone? To, that, to, to convey that feeling, that emotion, as you enter it, yeah. So, just to ask, we're <laughs> moving now on to, these are some of the works you're displaying here? No, so this is a, this was actually, I wanted to show this, this was, I made this in 2007, it was my first sculpture, um, and uh, it was called Quartet for the End of the Time, and it was after an Olivier Messiaen school. Okay. So I sandblasted the, the steel, I rusted the steel for four months, and then sandblasted music into the, uh, into the surface of the seal. So that's, again, you know, this was 2007. So now, you know, jumping nine years to then now, using, still using sandblasting, still getting that idea of actually things resting up against each other mm. has really translated now into the, into the new monument. Um, and then this was the piece you discussed earlier called Seven Times, which is actually the exact footprint of the Kaaba itself. 
So I'm almost turning the gallery into a, a, a religious space, is what I wanted to do. And, and didn't this piece also use a similar technique in terms of having the, the script? Exactly, so it was blue steel that then was um, sandblasted again at, along, the top of the, along the top of the piece. Um, 144, it, 144 steel cubes. Um, I was a massive fan of Carl Andre's work, um, and it's just a, uh, sort of a, a reference to that. And, and again, that's also an example of a, of, a, of a piece that's actually moving people around. You're kind of starting to kind of, you know, it's a sculptural piece, but you're actually starting to try and dictate how someone moves around the piece, exactly. which is coming through as well. Exactly, and then also you could walk through it and engage with the sculpture in, a, in, in a, not an everyday way as you would walk in a gallery space, creating the upstairs. Of, this is a, a gallery in London called Victoria Mirror Gallery. It's a very large space upstairs, and it, you know I wanted to bring the lights down. But you know this was made just after my mother died as well. So you know I've always had that link to that to that loss in my in my family. And this was the piece that also appeared at the British Museum. It did, yeah, part of the Hajj exhibition. What what in terms of kind of? Which you can imagine that being the atrium of the British Museum, the footfall around there was you know, however many visitors in three months, four months, how they circulated the piece. Exactly. It's quite amazing. So, I mean, so we're, we're talking today about a piece that kind of, uh, A, it's not only, not only is it the largest piece that you've ever done, but it's kind of, you know, this is going to be, in one way or another, we don't know how yet, but it will be a landmark in your, in your career. Would you say that this was one of the earliest one, examples of that, of kind of, a career-defining piece for you. It was, and you know, it was a level of engagement back to my my uh, my cultural upbringing, and how, you know, by stopping my my practice when I was 15, uh, practice of Islam. How could I then, as an artist, engage with my faith or the faith that I was raised in? And this did that, and it was very, it was defining. Absolutely. Just, just sorry, if you don't mind, just oh, yeah. kind of, just in case there's someone here who's not familiar with the work, just. Talk us through kind of how this piece came about and what, what happened. So I was, I, was, um, I was layering photographs and photographing every page of a certain book and layering up on top of each other. Um, this is my father. It was my father's Quran. And all, I think you had the pages, 9,000? 1,950. 1,950. And so <laughs> photographing every single page and layering up on, it, on, on top of each other and experiencing what it was like to actually read the Quran that slowly and engaging. Uh, the viewer to look at it for a slower amount of time. You know, photography, I mean, everyday uh, photography is very, very fast. You know, you're photographing things all the time. How many mobile phone pictures do we take all the time? So to create a photograph that was then able to slow the viewer's eyes down, that was very important to me. You know, always just like engaging in that very meditative way. Um, so many pictures in the world right now. You know, Google everything. You've got everything in front of you. You know, it's just so much availability. So instead of Instead of photographing the world out there, if you like, I went back into the studio and photographed objects around me, books, music, sheet music, and again tried to illustrate my hand, because I don't, I don't think a photograph necessarily does that. It, it, it represents your eye, it doesn't represent your hand. So I wanted to have an engagement with actually being able to draw with a photograph, basically. And then, how does that work in relation to? This? So this is a new work. This is a new wall drawing of mine, it's shown at the Whitworth Museum in Manchester right now, um, and it's uh, as you can see a large stamped work. So um, in around 2011, I wanted to create a way of making <coughs> drawings. You know, at the time I had uh, it was just after my mother died, and I was writing. I was, I was a series of writings that I just thought, you know, get out, get all this sort of feeling, this awful feelings I was having, writing, 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 and then I made them into stamps, and then I'd create stamp drawings. So then with this another med meditative <coughs> approach to making art, and, that's and then that, now, now it's transver you know, trans translated into a much bigger piece of art. So it's, I think it's around two hundred thousand marks in this particular work, which brings us back to what, what I'm showing here at the art fair. Um, those were early ones made on gesso surfaces. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted a way of almost separating the surface. So again, using glass to separate the surface, I stamped on three different surfaces. Um, and it's interesting because it's actually not three surfaces. You have the fourth surface, which is the wall. Mm -hmm. So the actual work itself is engaging with the wall. You don't read the painting necessarily, you read the wall. Because <laughs> then you look for language at the edges of the, of the, of the piece. 
So, so, you're, so, so on each one of those layers, there's multiple stampings on each layer, and then there's multiple layers. Yeah, exactly. So trace the, on a trace on a trace. So this is almost a kind of, a, a kind of um, a rendering, the layering that you were doing with the, with the images, actually kind of making that more concrete. Exactly, and it's a play with composition as well, because you know, I never really uh, give up what's, right, what's, what's written there. So it becomes a very abstract notion. You know, you read the edges of the, of the actual piece, but you can't read what's in the center. So you make, your, you make that middle bit up in your head. You know, you start the sentence and the end of the sentence, and then whatever baggage you want to bring to the piece, you can, and imagine something else or wherever you want to go. But then so it becomes completely abstract. And a lot of people want to know what I'm writing. In the end, it doesn't matter because the actual, the work itself is the first, is, is the writing. And then, and then the, the painting is then another expression, but it doesn't really matter about the content of what the words are anymore. It, be, it becomes a completely abstract experience. Fantastic. And this? That sculptural one that I've made recently. It's shown in a, a show in Berlin at Thomas Schulter Gallery. Um, so you can see then even exploring more and more layers of opening up the glass. Um, and then this is the final slide, <laughs> which is a piece that's here uh, on show again. Um, this was actually kind of, this, this is the new direction for my work. This is a piece that I've made that has a relationship to, the, to making the monument. So I wanted to create a work that was almost what it felt like when you were inside the space, looking for the angles, the shadows, the tones, and experiencing something, um, you know, what, almost using the, the sculpture itself to be the drawing element of this piece. Mm -hmm. So I made a little sculpture in the studio and photographed all around it. Because when I look at the sculpture, it's actually very much like a cubist painting from the back. It almost separates. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there's all these different layers from the back. And then so then with this, it's 81 unique paintings on aluminium that really transforms the viewer's eye. I don't think your eye necessarily rests. It really moves around the piece. And I think that's kind of what the monument does. I was going to say, as, as your eye does, as you're walking around the monument. But these, these are images taken from a model. They're not taken from the monument. No, from a model in the studio to create the certain angles and feeling of what it's actually like to be in there. The first layer is a tissue paper layer, so again, this beautiful sort of texture. Then it's black and white paint on top. But I wanted, again, it's got that rela relationship to transparency that I've always had in the photographs for looking for searching through layers. Um, and it's quite nice because your eye just bounces around, it doesn't focus on one thing. So the angles and geometry of the actual sculpture translates into 81 small paintings. How different would it be, given that that was taken from the, did, did it, did, did it, do you think, did you think through about how different it would be, the fact that that's coming from a model rather than from the, the monument itself? itself. Yeah. Well, I suppose, you know, at the time, the photograph, I couldn't photograph the piece because it wasn't finished. I mean, I was, when I was coming back and forth, I was getting really great shots of the angles and things like that. But no, because I think there was a different level of intimacy when you create something small in the studio and then you're photographing around it in a very cubist way, if you like, and bringing all these little pieces together. It didn't necessarily matter that I wasn't dealing with the scale of the monument because you can't comprehend the monument in one thing. Mm. When you're making a small model in the studio, you can comprehend the scale of it and move around it. You can't move around the monument. I mean, you can, sorry, you can't move around the monument as a whole. Yeah. And so, therefore, the angles were, were unattain, uh, unobtainable. So, is, and is that, that, that issue of scale, is that, is that what you're having to consider now? I mean, you've just, you, you're about to, when it's unveiled, people will see that, you know, this is the largest work that you've done so far. But are you now confronted with that issue of kind of, where, does, where, do, where do you go from there? Yeah, I'm just going to go and just make really, really tiny things now. <laughs> like really, really little delicate tiny things. No, I definitely got to go for 25 meters, 26 meters, 27 <laughs> meters, 28 meters. Um, but you know, who knows? This is this is you know the, the first thing that, that that I've done at this scale, and I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to do more because I really enjoyed the experience of of working with a landscape, and I think engaging with the landscape, the, the surrounding landscape, and um, I only want to be able to do that again, and inshallah, I will. Fantastic. That leaves us to the end of our time. Um, I'd like to thank Idris. I'd like to thank you all for coming, but I'd like to thank Idris. It's been fantastic to hear you speak about your work. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.